Okay. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and thank you for inviting me. And so I'm uh, going to be approaching this very literally. I was told, speak about what you did at Berkeley and what you've been doing after Berkeley in terms of research. So, but it's going to overlap very nicely with you because some of the names you have been mentioning have connected with me in various ways also. So let me just frame my presentation by saying that, and this was very useful to think about what have you been doing for the last 40 years, Salim, you know, in terms of your thinking and your writing and so on. And as you'll see, I think that by and large, my intellectual adventure, if you like, my scholarship, my writing, has really centered around questions of social justice in and through universities and more broadly within society. And my adventure has really been about the social structures, the conjunctures, the policies and the actions that either sustain inequalities and reproduce inequalities within universities or within society, and a deep interest in the social action and the agency of collectives, of individuals who try and undermine, erode those structures and conjunctions of injustice to create more egalitarian and more socially just universities and societies. And very practically, it has been involved at least for the last 25 years, since post-1994, with designing, implementing, and advocating for policies and mechanisms to bring about substantial change within universities and inclusion. So I want to reflect on that and just say that just before I came to CSHE for a wonderful uh, three-month break, my background research had really been around these questions of my big intellectual adventure. It had been around, my first book had been really around black student politics, higher education apartheid, was trying to understand exactly that. Uh, in a nutshell, without being uh, crude about it, how do we destroy apartheid? And how do we destroy apartheid higher education? And how do we create a different system of universities in South Africa and a different society to which universities contribute in meaningful ways but retain their autonomy and where academic freedom is safeguarded, okay? This is on a continent where often autonomy and academic freedom are not prized and disappear very quickly after liberation and independence. So this work on uh, student politics, on black man on your own, which is a slogan of the black consciousness movement, was really trying to look at that kind of. But immediately before coming to CSHE, I penned a piece on theorizing institutional change in South African higher education. And this was really trying to look at about 15 years of what had happened after 1994 and the wonderful constitutional promise uh, that had been negotiated in 1994 around one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. So there's some advantage of coming late uh, because you can borrow the best from around the world and set your goals really high. So there's a lot of things to be proud about in South Africa, including around questions of gay marriages and so on. We have led the way uh, around those kinds of issues. You know, Australia beats us in rugby, but they only voted to legalize it yesterday. Right. We did that a long time ago. Okay. So it was really trying to think about what, what kinds of institutional change were happening within South Africa. What was the global context in, within which we were attempting to bring about this change? And the first thing you realize is these are not very promising conditions. As much as uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall might have been favorable and really created the prospects of freedom in a big part of the world, uh, it was not very conducive to our own uh, context because the world became a unipolar world after 1989 and 1990. And our attempt to navigate our own part of South Africa to really pursue those kinds of dreams were being compromised at every level by social and political orthodoxies within which we were, we were having to work all the time. So very soon the, the constitutional promises were becoming under threat because the, the wider world within which we were living was not very favorable to questions of social justice and so on. If anything, it's become a more unequal world since 1994. And we were the most unequal society in the world competing with Brazil often in 1994. 
So how did one explain change and the fact that change was not happening post-1994, both within society and within universities? So that's what I really came to. But the other thing I turned my mind just before coming to CHE was an invitation to the World Social Con Science Conference at Berg Bergen. And I'd use that opportunity to really engage with this fascination now of global university rankings. Simon Marginson, of course, has also written, and we've written pretty similarly on these kinds of issues. Simon was uh, approaching it from a more kind of global perspective. My real interest has always been, what does this mean for the global south? What does this mean for South Africa and my continent that I come from? And so if you like, the subtitle of this paper uh, pretty well gives you my view about this present burden, and what I think is a perverse burden, uh, and the kind of distortions it creates in South Africa amongst universities by this clamor to climb the rankings and especially how harmful it has been to the arts and the humanities and the social sciences. Okay. I can give you many examples of the damage that is being done in South African universities because of this clamor to climb the rankings. And of course, the concept of world-class universities didn't exist until Jamil Salmi and someone else invented it, right? <laughs> and suddenly, there's this fascination of everyone wanting to be a world-class university. It's a destructive path for South African universities and for African universities. So actually, my period at, uh, as John will know, my period at uh, the Center for Studies in Higher Education actually was a respite from being a vice chancellor for eight years and uh, taking a three-month sabbatical to really finish a book which had nothing, thankfully, to do with higher education. It was actually on a topic uh, that no one had written about in South Africa and which the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had ignored, much to my anger. And this was about the banishment of South Africans <coughs> during the apartheid period who then lived under the most intolerable and harsh conditions. It was South Africa, Siberia. So everyone knows Nelson Mandela on Robben Island, but not many people know of these people who were banished. And the fact that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission didn't feature on them means that they don't appear in the archives as people whose human rights were violated. And therefore, they don't qualify for reparations. So the injustice doesn't uh, exist in the past. It goes into the future. Because the families have not benefited from reparations because they were not recognized as having had their human rights violated. Or they were recognized by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but because they don't appear in Volume 7, they can't get reparations. These things have real-life effects. So part of my work on this period, which had been going on for 30 years, was really to address this injustice in South Africa, the lack of talk about these forgotten people. So that was my real first uh, task when I came to CSHE. It was copy editing and finalizing this book, which then came out later in 2012. At the same time, while I was here, I was also finalizing a chapter that Martha Nussbaum and Zoya Hassan at, uh, at Jawala Nehru had been putting together. It was coming from a seminar that I was invited to in Mumbai, and it was about redressing the colonial and apartheid legacy. This is at a much more global level to the work Renato is doing around engineering education. Okay. And so that was really about, so how were South African universities, both individually and how was the country as a whole, addressing questions of redress, equity, all the things that the Constitution promises. And our Constitution doesn't have problems of affirmative action because it provides for positive discrimination. The idea that one day you wake up as a democracy and everything has uh, changed is not something we buy into. You don't wipe out uh, 300 years of colonialism and apartheid just because you become a democracy one morning in, in, in 1994. So this was really trying to engage with, you know, how are we, how are we going to undo that legacy in South African universities? You know? So this was trying to put my head around that of how are we tackling questions of admission? The usual meritocratic alone, or also questions of redress and equity and creating real opportunities for kids from working class families and rural poor families. So that I also finalized while I was there. And then there was a colleague who was at CHE at that time. I think she was from Norway or Scandinavia. And I remember us having wonderful discussions because at that time I also had brought homework. <laughs> I was on the executive committee of Higher Education South Africa, which represents universities. And we are putting our head towards creating a teaching and learning charter in South Africa, which becomes a compact between the state and universities and students and, and faculty and so on. So I spent 
you know, many days also working on that kind of charter and preparing it as part of uh, a social compact we were hoping to develop in South Africa. So that was essentially what I did at CSHE. It was a very productive period and it was a nice environment to work on. Immediately after getting back, actually one of the first keynotes I was invited to do was by Jenny Case at the South African Institute of Engineering Educators, and it was on the question of social justice. And around the same time, there was a conference on uh, institutional planning at research that Ulrich Teichler and I were invited to uh, speak about, and so that's what led to the next paper on thesis on institutional planning. In 2014, there was an uh, invitation to contribute to the question of uh, institutional alliances and mergers. Uh, for my sins or for my uh, pride, uh, I had been the head of the advisory body to the Minister of South African Education, the first uh, head after 1994, and I was pretty much in the thick of restructuring South African universities and reducing them from 36 universities to 21. And that happened through a process of institutional mergers and combinations. Often it simply required us to kick a fence down between the historically white and historically black and create a single university. Okay. And so this was a real opportunity to reflect on questions of mergers and alliances and uh, learn from that. You know. I'm a strong proponent of differentiation. I think it's a horrible or terrible idea for, university to, for, to, for a country to imagine that it can have 30 research universities. I think you need a highly differentiated system of universities and higher education, of research universities, of teaching universities, of community colleges, and so on. And we made a terrible mistake in 94, turning our back on that differentiation. And it's, we're still paying the price for that. And so this was really an attempt to uh, rethink that and relearn some of the things and so on. Same time, uh, invite from Robert Rodberg from Harvard around taking part in a seminar on Mandela's legacy led to peace on South African education and the challenge of social justice, and this starts to become a critique of the ANC policies in education after 1994. And so I should say that during this period, being a busy vice chancellor, I don't have time to have a big research program that faculty have the wonderful gift of having. I accept particular keynotes, I do a lot of research for that, and that becomes the journal article, or becomes the chapter. Same time, Philip Albach says, do something on academic inbreeding, I do a scan, and in the whole history of South African higher education, there's one short paper on academic inbreeding. So I start to work on that, and it becomes a very fascinating area of research. 19, 2016, 40th anniversary of the Soweto uprising, the student or youth uprising in South Africa. I get invited to do a paper on that, and it comes out as part of a book on students must rise. And I get back into student politics, uh, partly deliberately because of the invite, but partly uh, uh, by chance. The student protests break up, massive student protests break up in between 15 and 17. Parallels the ones in South Africa. I've tried to create a research project around that, which is looking at this, and that was the last bit of research I do. Finally, a critique of Nelson Mandela's idea of higher education as instrument for social mobility. Uh, let me just leave it at that, and this again connects with your work. I'm not convinced, and I think it's overstated, the role of universities as mechanisms of social mobility. I think if you do the research very carefully, you may find a lot to talk about, and that there are real limits to the role that universities play in social mobility, including in a country like South Africa. Certainly, I know, in a country like the UK. And so this is an area that I've started to do more work on. Thanks, John. Thank you very much. Thank you.